Okay, you ready? Pastor, could you open in prayer? And we uh, thank you so much again that we can be here with your people and in this place. Father, we have a lot of prayer requests and a lot of uh, needs as a church family, and we lift them up for you, all those unspoken requests, and ask that you work in a very divine way. For today, Lord, as we prepare our hearts to be with you and, and, and hear from Scripture, we pray that we would be receptive, that our hearts would be tender, that your Holy Spirit would do its work in us, and that we would allow it to. Pray that you just pour your uh, spirit through Keith this hour. Pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I noticed as I was going through the um, the book here, the Word Made Flesh, that there are still a lot of articles of affirmation and denials to go through. Enough that it would take us almost six months to do them one at a time. <laughs> so I figure... Uh, starting now, the, the first four were very important articles, and it was a good idea to look at them. These next ones, um, I've tried to do four at a time, which will still take us about six weeks um, to finish all of them. Uh, I do want to go through them because I think it's important for us to understand because these do specifically tie back to the um, to the Christology statement itself, making uh, a more in-depth understanding of the different phrases and sentences that are brought out in this statement. Um, but starting this week, I'm going to try and go through four of them at a time. Um, and instead of reading every verse that's under it, I've highlighted the verses so that you can go through them on your own. But there is one verse that is included, and then in a couple of them, I took an extra verse out of the list, which I thought were really important to look at. So, that being said, um, John, could you read Article 5, the We Affirm and We Deny paragraphs? Paragraphs? There's two paragraphs there. There's a We Affirm and then We Deny. Article 5, we affirm that in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, his divine and human natures retain their own attributes. We affirm that the attributes of both natures belong to the one person, Jesus Christ. We deny that the human nature of Jesus Christ has divine attributes or can contain the divine nature. We deny that the divine nature communicates divine attributes to the human nature. We deny that the Son laid aside or gave up any of his divine attributes in the Incarnation. So here we're seeing again that they're clarifying this issue of the divine nature and the human nature truly being 100% divine with no humanity and 100% human with no divine nature and also um, I think it's important for them to clarify, and they did here, that the divine nature does not communicate divinity to the human nature. There is no mixture. When they talk about mixture in, in it, that's what it's getting at, is there's, there's nothing that crosses between the human Jesus walked in faith just as he expects us to walk in faith. His walk in faith was no different than our walk in faith, except he did not sin. He depended on the Holy Spirit to guide him. He depended on the Father to provide for his needs. 
as he said many times, everything I say or everything I do proceeds from the Father. That is a statement of obedience. That is a statement that I am obeying the Father as I expect you to obey the Father. Let me read the, pat, the, the verse that they brought out, and this is, again, one of the most clear verses, but it's, it says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God to be a, thi a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And that's Philippians 2, 5 through 7. So Paul is, is saying that our minds should follow the example Jesus set. And that example Jesus set was, even though he knew, he knew that he was a divine person. He became a human person, and both his divine nature and his human nature walked in that tabernacle, that person of Jesus Christ. It's always important for us to understand there is the fact that both the divine and the human were fully present, neither one interfering with the other. He could not, they, they could not say, or the scriptures could not say that he was tempted in all points like we unless he was fully human. Yet without sin. So Article 6, Pastor, could you read that one? We affirm that Jesus Christ is the visible image of God, that he is the standard of true humanity, and that in our redemption, we will be ultimately conformed to his image. We deny that Jesus Christ was less than truly human, that he merely appeared to be human, or that he lacked a reasonable human soul. We deny that in the hypostatic union, the son assumed a human person rather than a human nature. So, and that's an important thing to understand here. Could you read the next, or uh, the verse in the? He is, oh, okay. he is yep. the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And that's Colossians 1, 15 and 16. So again, we're seeing here that he is the image of God, the firstborn of creation. That's divinity and humanity. Um, I wanted to read Hebrews 1 verses 3 and 4. This is an additional verse that's out of this list of verses here. Um, starting with verse 3, and it says, And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. And how more so can he be the exact representation? Trying to get my wor words out of my mouth here. <laughs> How better to be the exact representation of his nature than to have that divine nature. To be that divine nature. But more so to be that human nature. And we're going to see this here. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made... Purification for sins. Now, how did he do that? 
Anybody want to? Anybody want to say? He died on the cross, exactly. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels to the extent that he has inherited a more excellent name than they. And remember, this is Hebrews, the the passage in Hebrews, where the author is drawing a comparison and contrast showing that Jesus was not an angel. Very explicitly, almost the whole chapter deals with the fact that even though he was made lower than the angels for a little while, he was higher than the angels. And he started higher, was made lower, and then became higher again. Higher than anything else, as, as he's getting at here. That he is exalted above all things. Somebody want to read Article 7, the first, uh, the two paragraphs for it? We affirm that as truly man, Jesus Christ, possessed in a state of humiliation all the natural limitations and common infirmities of human nature. We affirm that he was made like us in all respects, yet he was with without sin. We deny that Jesus Christ sinned. We deny that Jesus Christ did not truly experience suffering, temptation, or hardship. We deny that sin is inherent to true humanity or that the sinlessness of Jesus Christ is incompatible with his being truly human. Now, I wanted to look at those last two phrases here because I think that they're in a way subtle, but they're key to understanding what they're saying here in the denial. They're saying, we deny sin is inherent to true humanity. Now, when God created Adam and Eve, he did not create them as sinners. It was not inherent in their nature when he created them. Otherwise, they would not have been created in his image because he is without sin. So Adam and Eve were created without sin. It was not inherent in their nature. It became endemic to them when they sinned. And all humanity fell when Adam fell. That's what Paul teaches clearly in the book of Romans. That when Adam fell, all fell. So we are all sinners by nature of the fact that we proceed from a sinful person who became sinful by committing sin. And so we see here that being human is truly not being a sinner just because we're human. We're descended from a fallen Adam. That's what makes us sinners. Jesus was not descended directly or completely. On his mother's side, yes. But on his father's side, he was a descendant, he was a child, he was the son of God. And this also is taken up if you look at how he is portrayed in the New Testament. There are two phrases. Jesus preferred to use the phrase with respect to himself as the son of man. But Mary was told he would be the son of God. So he is both the son of God and the son of man divine nature and human nature. It's right there as we see the Son of God being divine 
is able to lift us out of our sinful state. The human nature is able to make that perfect sacrifice which is needed to lift us out. Certainly no human could raise himself from the dead. That's Jesus' divinity. Certainly God cannot die. That's Jesus' humanity. Romans 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. I wanted to read that one. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So he's talking about two different kinds of law here. The law which is appropriated by faith and the law which is appropriated by works. One earns wages of sin, which is death. And the other is a gift of God, which is eternal life. For what the law again, the law of sin and death, could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. So we see again here, Jesus the man came and he died providing that perfect sacrifice. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled. See, and that's the other part of this whole story is that Jesus walked that perfect walk. He did not sin. I forget who it was I heard say this, but there are three things that are pointed out in, in the New Testament by different, different authors. Peter said he did no sin. Paul said he knew no sin. John said in him was no sin. All three of those are different aspects in, in a sense. The mind, the actions or the will, and the nature. All three of those are part of who he was. In Jesus, the person, whether he be in Jesus, the human, or in Jesus, the divine, was no sin. And his sacrifice provides for these three things that our thought lives can be changed by the working of the Holy Spirit. Our actions, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. As Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That is the, partly the mechanism of salvation. But a lot of people forget verse 10, which says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, what? Unto good works that God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So those actions that we do, if they're truly righteous, they're sourced from the Holy Spirit. And they are genuinely good works. So our actions are changed. And as
as Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Our natures have been changed. The very nature of who we are has gone from being sinners to being believers. Now, it doesn't mean that we're not going to sin. What it does mean is that by God's grace, we can walk in faith. Somebody want to read Article 8? We affirm that the historical Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, was miraculously conceived and was born of the Virgin Mary. <clears throat> we affirm with the Chalcedonian Creed that she is rightly called Mother of God the octocos, in that the child she bore is the incarnate Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity. We deny that Jesus Christ received his divine nature from Mary, or that his sinlessness was derived from her. Again, we're seeing something very important and very key here. This whole idea of the Immaculate Conception that the Catholic Church teaches is not right. Mary was a sinner, just as any one of us is a sinner. Mary was human, just as any one of us is human. How did Jesus, how was Jesus born, being both God and man? First of all, Someone had to be the mother. And that mother was fully human. And then his divine nature from the Father. Each one of us, I think each one of us has had, well, is either a child of someone or has had children. <laughs> um, but knowing that we can look at our children and our grandchildren and see how much of us or how much of our how much of us is in our children and how much of our grandchildren is in our children and us there's this thing that we can see that partly it's the nature but it's also you know you're the spitting image of your uncle or you're the spitting image of your mom or whatever but the point of the matter is, from each parent comes attributes of who that person is. And it's no different here. Jesus the divine had a divine father. Jesus the human had a human mother. It's as simple as that. Let's not try and read anything more into it than that. Because that's how simple it can get. Well, we shouldn't try to read into things more than what really is there. I think that's one of the things. Take the word for what it says. When the angel announced to Mary, you're going to bear a son, and his name will be called Emmanuel, for he will save people from their sins. It was just that. She was going to have a child. And that child is going to have God as his father. I wanted to read Galatians 4 verses... Uh, no, actually, we didn't read that verse here. Somebody want to read the, the first verse at the beginning of that list? In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin bethroned to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Luke uh, chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. See also Matthew. Okay, so again, we're seeing here the angel telling Mary she's going to have a child. And then Paul writes this in Galatians. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 say this. 
But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. In Ephesians, Paul talks about us as Gentiles being far off, not participants of the promise. Not participants of the promise as seen in the covenant of Moses. But we are participants of the promise as seen in the covenant that God made with Abraham. In John chapter 10, Jesus talks about, I am the good shepherd, and he lays down all the proofs of why he is a shepherd first, and that he is the good shepherd, and that he lays down his life for the sheep. And then he goes on to say at the very end of that, and I have another fold which I will bring in, and they will be one fold, one shepherd. Who is that other fold? We are. We. Us. Exactly. Dick, could you pray? Sure. Lord and Father, we thank you that we are saved by grace through faith. We thank you, Lord, for sending us a Savior to live, teach, and die for us. We might have eternal salvation. And we just thank you so much. And in and, and May, as the service goes over to the main service this morning, uh, we pray for our pastor that he will bring forth the word of God, as he always does, and fill this room full, full, full of sinners, Lord. That they may have the same thing that we have right now, that we are saved by grace through faith. We thank you so much for Brother uh, Keith this morning bringing us forth this message. And we thank you so much for him. In Jesus' name, amen.